Thank you. Now this is not meant to be a presentation. This is meant to be an interaction because dentistry cer certainly is, to many people, scary and sort of a mystery. And we want to solve that mystery and make it not so scary if at all possible. So we're going to talk about a myriad of things. I put together a program, but that program can be thrown away and we can answer questions. Or I received about eight to 10 questions ahead of time. So I will answer those questions. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask the questions. I will repeat the question for the camera so that uh, this is being videotaped so that other people can see it. So remember, this is your presentation today. This is not mine. So I want to answer your questions. And when I leave, I hope that if you have questions that you want to ask privately, I'll stay around for a little while. Thank you. I'm going to talk about, a little bit about evidence-based dentistry. And what we're going to is evidence-based dentistry versus dentistry the way it's always been done. And so I have given uh, the evidence on a couple of things uh, to you so that if you want to refer to that ev evidence, you can. Because the, what we're finding is times have changed, issues have changed, and dentistry needs to be more proactive for the patient and less reactive for the doctor. So let's see if we can go there. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is fillings. Everybody wants to know about fillings. There are really two types of fillings. There are silver fillings and there are composite or plastic fillings. The plastic fillings are more aesthetic. The plastic fillings usually cost more. The plastic fillings usually don't last as long. But some people like them as the alternative to the silver. Silver has had 130 years of research behind it. The issues that are there are that it is, a, it is a metal. It is mixed with mercury. And the mercury, when it, when it mixes with the silver, it binds to the silver. Now, there is a minute amount of, of mercury released uh, initially, but also when chewing. But that has been, that's measured in nanograms. It's, uh, very small. Uh, the issue with the Board of Dentistry is if somebody is telling you they want to replace your silver fillings because of health issues, that's not, appreci not appreciated by the Board and the Board will take action against a dentist if they do that. But if you have an allergy to metals and it's proven, then that is purely appropriate. And about one-tenth of one percent of the people have allergies to the metals and amalgam and it's appropriate then to change those metals. The, also, there's a question with multiple sclerosis. Some people say, well, the, the silver fillings cause uh, episodic uh, return of multiple sclerosis. The Multiple Sclerosis Society says that doesn't happen. The issue with the plastic or composite fillings is they're usually a product of petroleum-based products. Some of them are estrogen enhancers. So in young women, there's a concern there. It's very small. So no matter what you get, please ask your doctor to explain to you what the filling is, what your alternatives are, and if you choose a filling, please ask the questions of what's in that filling. Because those are important questions for you to get answered so that you can make the right decision on fillings. Usually in larger fillings, uh, the, the silver is, n is longer lasting, but in really large fillings, uh, neither one works really well because the structure of the tooth is undermined and it's important then to look at a crown or an onlay or something like that. So that's why you go to those sorts of things. Or if you've had a root canal and a posterior tooth, usually a crown makes sense. Let's talk about crowns a little bit. The evidence shows that about 4% of the crowns uh, have problems after seven years. So that's why there's a seven year period when if you replace the crown. Uh, the the crowns now are made of several materials. Zirconium. Zirconium is the internal ceramic, and then they build the porcelain over it. It's very strong. It's very aesthetic. There's also metal crowns. There's a titanium crown. There's a gold crown. And then the gold is rated according to its nobility, how noble or how much gold is in it, and platinum. So uh, when they offer you a crown, I think the important thing is to get, again, what are your alternatives? Usually in anterior teeth from premolars forward to premolars are the little bicuspids here. Usually it makes good sense to have a, uh, some type of porcelain crown unless you don't mind showing the gold or something like that. Uh, it is also important that if you grind your teeth, 
be sure that you some way get a guard or something like that because porcelain tends to be very abrasive. It's made up of little glass particles. So if you grind your teeth, it tends to be more abrasive than, say, gold or something like that. So if you're going to get a, a porcelain crown, please make sure that you check with the doctor about some uh, night habits where you're grinding your teeth or something like that. Okay, let's talk about implants. Implants used to be the, uh, the cutting edge, and now they're the state of the art. Implants are, they take a titanium cone and they put it into the bone. And that sounds terrible, but you've got to remember the bone is not innervated. So there's no nerves in the bone. So what happens is when you put that titanium in, it does not bother you. It does not hurt. They numb the tissue up over it, but when they go through there to put the bone in, it, uh, put the uh, titanium cone into the bone, usually you don't have any difficulty with that. Now there's two ways to do that. They can leave it there and let it, what they call integrate, where the bone grows into the titanium. The titanium's roughened, so the bone integrates with that. Some of them load or put a crown on that titanium uh, implant immediately. And it just depends on, again, your oral habits on chewing and stuff like that, where it is in the mouth, uh, aesthetics and everything to see whether you load it immediately or whether you uh, wait usually three to five months for the bone to integrate and they put a, a stainless steel healing cap over that and then at that t next time they take the healing cap off and they put something called an abutment in and the abutment it, it screws into the uh, into the implant and then what happens is they put the crown over the abutment 97% of the uh, implants are successful. Unless you've got periodontal disease or you're a heavy smoker when they put in the uh, implant or something like that because the smoking tends to stop the healing process. Now, if you, uh, implants are so important because what happens is in many places, that's all you can put in there. And oftentimes they have put bridges in there where they prepare the two teeth on either side. I got a racquetball racket in the my front of my teeth and I have a bridge down there. I wish I'd had an implant, but it happened 30 some years ago. The issue there is that you don't have to prepare those adjacent teeth. You don't have to cut them down in order to put a bridge over it. The problem with crowns and bridges is you get recurrent decay around the margins where the crown meets the tooth. Second thing that can happen is you can get fractures. Uh, you can oftentimes the crown will wear and it has to be replaced and you're taking more tooth structure away, which increases the trauma, which increases the possibility of needing a root canal on that tooth. With an implant, you don't have those difficulties because you're putting the implant right where the tooth was. So it makes it a little better for you to have that in the long term. Sealants. Sealants are a plastic that are put in the grooves of the teeth. Now what happens is, oftentimes where we see problems is we see problems where the bacteria settles into those grooves. And people will brush, but not well. And so that's where the bacteria starts demineralizing the tooth. Once the tooth is demineralized, it becomes softer. And the bacteria, and the bacteria releases an acid as a byproduct and it continues to eat on the tooth. Once it causes, goes into the second layer of the tooth, it's a cavity. Sealants seal that groove so the bacteria cannot settle there. Now, does everybody need sealants? No. If you've gone, I, I have one doctor that put in 17 sealants in an adult woman's teeth. She's gone 30 some years without any decay in those teeth. She's brushed them well. There is no reason to go in there and do that unless he's seeing in small decay or something like that, and there was no indication, nor when I called for his chart notes, was there any indication there was decay. It was says she had deep grooves, and uh, there was a possibility of decay. That's not a good enough reason. The, also, the evidence, which I've left here, is that the evidence shows that sealants are most effective in permanent molars only. Now, lots of people like to seal the premolars, some people like to seal the grooves on the, uh, on the back of the incisors. There's no evidence to show that that's effective. So if you're going to get sealants, it's the best thing to do is on unrestored molars because the sealant adheres to the tooth. And the second thing is it should be permanent molars. It's rare that they put it into a, a child's deciduous teeth. 
The deciduous tooth is a little softer than the, uh, than the permanent tooth, so sealants sometimes don't stay as well. Sealants should last a minimum of two years, and uh, in my practice when I was pra practicing, uh, we saw people that had sealants for seven and 10 years and longer. So it's important on the process they put that sealant in. First of all, the tooth has to be dry when the sealant is put there. Second of all, it's important that the etch, the uh, small, they put a small concentration of phosphoric acid which opens up those tubules in the tooth. And what happens is then they put a bonding agent with a light cure and then they put the sealant on that and it seals to the, it bonds to that tooth. So if they do it correctly, and if, they, if the uh, tooth is uh, dry, it's going to be a successful sealant for quite a while. Cleanings. Uh, I'm in a, in a discussion with some of our, our, our patients up in Alaska because the dentists have recommended up to nine cleanings a year. Well, first of all, nine cleanings a year is excessive. We have a dental hygiene school, and the dental hygiene school the process of removing calculus, the hard tartar material on the teeth, it tends to be abrasive. And they scrape that off the tooth. And when they scrape that off the tooth, you take a part of the tooth with it. Nine cleanings a year is excessive. Usually, people ha have two. But uh, the, one of the questions we're going to get to is, how do you know how many cleans you need in a year? Well, first of all, when you see your dentist, one of the things that I recommend when you ask, see a new dentist is do they do a risk assessment for you? Each patient doesn't need two cleanings a year or bite wings every six months or those sorts of things. It depends on what they find as far as your oral health, as far as the diet you eat, as far as your brushing habits, as far as the flossing and everything you do. It really depends. And it's also a chemistry of the body. Some people build up calculus or, t or tartar very quickly, and other people don't at all. So it's very important that your cleaning be appropriate for you. Now, people that have had periodontal disease usually need more cleanings. And when we get to diabetes and stuff, I'll talk about why we think diabetics and pregnant women need more cleanings than the average population. But again, it's a risk assessment the doctor makes, and they should make that individual to every patient so that there's no confusion that you come in, you sit down, it's your six-month recall. You may not need a six-month recall, first of all. You sit down, and they take two to four bite wings, and then the doctor comes in. Not appropriate anymore. Now it's a, it's a time to make that appropriate to you. Yes? Question uh -huh. about cleanings. Um, you mentioned that. Uh, it's chemistry mm -hmm. that causes the uh, tartar calcium buildup. Yes. Um, I, I've been, well, a year or so ago, I was diagnosed with GERD, and it seems to me like I'm having more um, buildup, I guess, that I have to work harder uh, yes. to keep that down. Could that be possibly because of? The question is, uh, do you, because of uh, certain uh, illnesses or certain si symptoms, do you need more cleanings? And the, the question is yes. Also, diet can affect what you have to do as far as cleanings. Also, the type of toothpaste you use can affect the buildup on your teeth. So it's very important, again, that you have that discussion with your doctor. Uh, I tend to build up calculus faster than most. I use an anti-tartar toothpaste, but the issue with the anti-tartar toothpaste is it makes your mouth pretty sensitive and if you use it for a long-term period of time. So if you do build up, I recommend you use the tartar-controlled toothpaste, but switch it up every two weeks with a regular toothpaste for about a week. Your mouth will do just as well, and the chemicals will still be there to fight the tartar, but you won't get the sensitive tissues and the teeth. So that's that's... One thing, and I think GERD is GERD is where you have a reflux of stomach acid, and it's usually it can be anxiety, it can be a number of things, uh, diet, it can be ulcers, it can be many things that cause GERD. The issue with that is that reflux of acid can cause deterioration of the teeth. It also can cause other problems within the mouth. So the important thing is it to control it. Now that's why they sell Nexium and all those sorts of medications. But you can also control that with diet. Uh, spicy foods, cut that out a little bit. Uh, go more towards the uh, something with calcium in it that keeps the acid in your, le uh, your uh, stomach down a little. 
So those are things you can do just naturally without having to go and buy a pill and everything like that. But GERD is a real problem now, and we do see it as a problem in dentistry. Okay, let's talk about medical uh, risk assessment, excuse me. We already talked about it. I don't want to bore you again with risk assessment, but it should be, you should have a score. There should be a score for risk assessment. And it should be low, medium, or high risk. And that determines whether, what, how often you get your x-rays, how often you get your cleanings, uh, and those sorts of things. So that risk assessment's very important. And when we see risk assessment, it's becoming an ish, a thing in dentistry now, whereas before, there was never, there was a risk assessment, but it was more or less in the dentist's head, and it was never written down anywhere. And so what happens is, the new, the new uh, assistant or something, or the new hygienist or whatever, doesn't have that information, and so, well, we better take these x-rays, or we better do this. It needs to be written in the chart. If it's not in the chart, it didn't happen. So that's really important, because the Board of Dentistry have a couple of patients that were charging us for uh, buildups and everything like that, and I said, I have your chart notes in front of me, and I don't see in your chart notes that you did a buildup. Oh, it's not there? I said, no. And the Board of Dentistry says, if it's not in the chart, it did not happen. So it's very important that the chart notes are complete. Yes, another question? Well, yeah, just uh, I'm kind of going back to your comment about dentists and um, replacing cleaning or re replacing fillings mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. I, I unfortunately have a dentist. I think that um, I need to get a new one because they recommended I replace all of my fillings because it was you know, leaking and it can cause more cavities and that kind of stuff. And then um, also, it's like everything they want to do, the mouth x-rays, they want to do everything. So um, if, you're, if you're seeing those sort of things, it sounds like uh, you should be looking for a new dentist. But could you also com comment on the full mouth x-rays? Sure. There's several types of full mouth x-rays. There are panoramic x-rays where the, you stand still and the machine goes around. And it's a film about like that. And it shows most of the mouth. It doesn't do well on the anterior teeth, or the front teeth. But it shows the, ang the jawbone. It shows where the nerves uh, go through the jawbone. It's especially good for people that are going to have their wisdom teeth out because you see where they are. You see where the root is compared to the nerve that comes down there. Uh, so those are pretty important. Uh, they're also taken, and cephalometric x-rays are taken when people are going to get orthodontia because they then can watch. They see the positioning of the teeth, and they can then uh, in a cephalometric x-ray, they can sort of dice it so they can see different angles of it. So when they put torque on those teeth, they don't, if there's too much torque on a tooth in orthodontia, it will resorb the root. It'll dissolve the root. So that's why it's important not to be p impatient with an orthodontist. Give them the time to move the teeth into the proper place because then you'll have the teeth in that position for the longest time. There are full mouth x-rays. Full mouth x-rays are 16 films usually. And they take uh, two bite wings, and then they take uh, what they call our periapical x-rays. In other words, you see the, the root of the tooth as well as the surrounding bony tissue and the crown or the top of the tooth. In a bite wing x-ray, you only see the crowns of the upper and lower teeth. We recommend full mouth x-rays every seven years. And the reason for that is because even the, the x-rays have gotten better. They're, they're lower dosage of x-ray and the films are faster. So the patient's not irradiated as much as they used to be. And an x-ray in the mouth is far less than a chest x-ray or anything. But radiation is additive. And if you fly in an airplane a lot, you're getting a lot of exposure to radiation. Outside in certain areas, you're getting a lot of exposure to radiation. So let's minimize the amount of x-ray to what's therapeutically necessary and diagnostic x-ray so that you don't have an excess number of, of uh, radiation or x-rays in your mouth. So that's the other one are they sometimes uh, doctors will take seven what they call vertical bite wings where they put it in there and they can take pictures of the upper and lower roots and crowns but there's a very small survey area and then for ch young children, they'll do something called an occlusal. And an occlusal film's about that big. And what happens is they put it in to have the child bite on it. And then they shoot from this way and this way. And they can see if the permanent teeth are forming. They can see if there's congenitally missing teeth. They can see if there's some abnormality, uh, uh, such as a uh, 
tumor or anything like that, they can see those on young children very quickly. And so occlusal x-rays are usually just for children. Now, x-rays, they have two types. They have digital x-rays and they have regular x-rays with an x-ray machine. Digital x-rays are better than the regular x-rays because there's, again, less radiation. They're much faster. You don't get a film, it shows up on a computer screen. And then they can go through there and they can highlight it or they can increase the brightness or whatever if they see something that's questionable. You can't do that on a film. About right now, we're seeing about maybe 50 to 60% of the offices are digital and it's moving very fast towards almost all digital. Uh, so, and there's no uh, chemicals that you have to use to develop those x-rays. Because if you take a regular x-ray, you've got to send it through a developer and a lot of those chemicals then have to be uh, shipped and they're considered uh, hazardous waste. So it's important that you look at those things and you say, hey, I want to go this way. It's better for me. It's better for the environment. And so you look at those things and say, that's, that's what you want to do. Let's talk a little about diabetes. Diabetes, there are about 25 million people in the United States with diabetes and another 54 million people in the United States that the concern is that they, they're subject to it. And just it's not been diagnosed. What are some of the indications for diabetes? Increased thirst, increased hunger, increased uh, urination, uh, altered taste of the mouth, increased cavities. I had a patient who we could not figure out why he was getting decay. And so I sent him to uh, his doctor and they did a a test for diabetes and he was diabetic. And once we got his diabetes under control, his decay stopped. The reason diabetes is such a problem is because it's an inflammation. Diabetes, uh, insulin is produced, produced in the pancreas of the, uh, in, in, uh, in the body. And what happens is that insulin moves, takes the food, the lipids, and moves them to uh, energy for the cells so the cells can do their function and they can divide and all that. What happens in diabetes is the insulin breaks down there. So it, then we get increased inflammation. So what happens with people that have periodontal disease and stuff like that, if they're diabetic, their periodontal disease and an inflammation, and because they don't, have, they don't have enough insulin, so it becomes cyclic. And so what happens is it gets worse and worse. So that's why we recommend that diabetics have more cleanings. And we recommend up to four cleanings a year, once a quarter, for people with diabetes. And it's important because we can control that inflammation. And if we can control that inflammation, other symptoms and other problems could be taken care of with that. So we think that diabetes needs to be uh, looked at closer. We're getting more and more diabetics. As we increase in girth, we're noticing the increase in diabetics significantly. The way to deal with some of that is increased ex exercise decrease on the sugary foods, the colas and those sorts of things, uh, and more fruits and vegetables. Those things will help you, just your, your diet can help you with the diabetes. Now, there's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Some people uh, don't have the luxury of being able to control their diabetic, diabetes with, with uh, diet and exercise. But most of us do, if we, if we really look at this, most of us do, and we need to, we need to know what our, uh, our glucose level is. If we can lower the glycemic level by 1%, we can increase lifespan by 10 years. And I did an anesthesiology rotation at the medical school after my dental studies, and I had patients that were diabetics. And what happens is the diabetes, they start shutting down the extremity circulation. So it wasn't unusual uh, to have to do amputations on severe diabetics or uncontrolled diabetics, uh, issues with glaucoma, issues with uh, eyes and stuff like that. So it's really important that we know our, our glycemic level and we know if we need to do something to control that. Yes, excuse me. Um, what about insulin resistance? Do you see the same incidence of problems with your dental? We do, we do. And this is an off the subject, and I'm sorry, but we also see it with meth addicts. Meth addicts have severe decay. I mean, when you see a meth addict's mouth, it's destroyed, and it's destroyed two ways. One, decay, and two, they've absolutely ground their teeth flat. And getting them uh, back into control because of the inflammation, and if they're, ins if they're insulin resistant or diabetic, it really gets bad. So 
we see that quite a bit. So that's a, something that wasn't on my thing, and I'll just bring it up. Respiratory. Asthma and nose. If you can imagine the amount of bacteria in somebody's mouth, and they inhale that, and it, the bacteria gets into their lungs. Now, if you're asthmatic or if you're older and have uh, you know, breathing disorders or something like that, it can cause some severe respiratory problems. Now, there's no cause and effect yet, but that what there is is an association between people that have high bacteria and incidence of, of respiratory disease because of that bacteria. They're working very hard to see if there's a cause and effect there, but right now, they say that if there's somebody with a breathing, my mother had COPD, and what happened was, we had to keep her mouth absolutely clean or we noticed an incidence of greater difficulty in breathing and stuff. So it was very important that we took care of that. Um, pregnancy. It is known that decay in cavities is a contagious disease. And it is passed from mother, usually mother to child. Now, it depends on the primary caregiver. It's, if it's the father, it's from father to child. But the problem with that is, is that the bacteria of the mother's mouth is passed to the child. And that bacteria is some of the bacteria that causes decay. We believe there's two things about pregnancy. First of all, there are studies out there, and it's about 50-50, that people with, women with periodontal disease that are pregnant have a higher incidence of preterm and low birth weight babies. Preterm is before 37 weeks. Low birth weight is 5.5 pounds. So the incident is greater, and it's about eight times greater in women with periodontal disease. So what we're trying to figure out is how we can control some of that. So we think that women that are pregnant, used to be that you didn't touch a pregnant woman except in their second trimester. That's been debunked. You should have cleanings. The, the bacterial load of the mother's mouth is so important for a couple reasons. One, for her health and her fetus at that time. But second of all, lowering the bacterial load in that mother's mouth after the baby's born decreases the incidence of, of passage of bacteria to, from the mother to the child. So it has that dual effect. So we believe that it's really important that people that are pregnant have increased cleanings also you notice that people, that, ladies that are pregnant, have hormonal problems where their gums bleed a lot easier. And that's why uh, if the brushing and cleaning of the mouth is not better at that time, it'll get much worse. There's such thing as pregnancy gingivitis, which what happens is it gets so sore in there and it bleeds so easily when they brush that oftentimes they stop brushing. And then it gets worse. So it's really important that uh, pregnancy, we take special precautions to make sure both the mother and the fetus and the uh, born child uh, is taken care of. Bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are drugs that are used for women with uh, osteoporosis and people with advanced cancer, usually people that uh, women with breast cancer. Bisphosphonates have been a, a super medication and it's done remarkable things but when we have bisphosphonates in a patient and they have a problem with the uh, their teeth it's very important that the doctor the dentist knows that the patient is taking bisphosphonates and the reason for that is is because it breaks down the healing process of the bone so what happens is when a doctor will take a tooth out that socket, that bony area that usually heals, doesn't. It becomes necrotic. And there have been people that have lost parts of their jaws and the other things like that. And it's a simple process of dealing with the bisphosphonates. It also is very particular to certain bisphosphonates and higher concentrations of bisphosphonates. So it's really important that if you're on bisphosphonates, and a lot of people are, to let your dentist know, and also let them know, your physician know, if you're gonna have a dental procedure that requires surgery, uh, to, to both of them get together to figure out, should they discontinue the bisphosphonates for a period of time? I've seen where a tooth needed to be removed and because the patient was on high levels of bisphosphonate, they've done a root canal on the root and cut the crown off just to keep the tooth there because they're afraid of the necrosis of the bone itself. So it's really important that that connection between their oral health and your, your uh, physical health be, uh, there's better coordination of that care. Drug interactions. Uh, 
it's, we have so many medications out there now, and all of them do wonderful things, but the interactions of those medications can be problems. For instance, women on birth control pills, antibiotics don't work. Or they take the antibiotics, and the birth controls don't work. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you know what's going on. Now, we have a site that you can get on through, I think it's Mimota. Uh, and you can go there, and there's a site for oral medications. And you can get on there, and you can find out what medications you're taking and what, what oral conditions that causes. People that are on asthmatic drugs, their mouth tends to be dry, so they have a higher incidence of decay because what happens is it's the saliva that neutralizes and cleans away the bacteria. If you don't have the saliva, you have a higher incidence of decay. So medications taken appropriately are absolutely correct. Just know what the side effects are and if there is any contraindication with another medication that you take so that it does not cause you problems. So I would, if, you're gonna, if you're on medications, just go to my motor and you can type in either the, the trade name or the generic name and it should pop it right up for you and give you that information. Even if you misspell it, it will it'll come on. And some of those drugs, it's easy to misspell. Uh, cardiovascular, we're finding that cardiovascular disease is really an inflammatory disease. And what's happening is people that have periodontal disease, we're finding that some of the cardiovascular problems, we're finding those bacteria from the mouth in the cardiovascular issues up, up in the heart and stuff. Now, it's again, not a cause and effect, it's an association. But they're getting closer and closer to believing that that bacteria is causative to some other problems. As that inflammation happens, the vessels tend to be less, um, uh, I guess I would say they, they don't, uh, they're not as flexible. They don't open and close as well as they should. So those are problems that we've got to be really careful about and make sure that if you have periodontal disease or if you have uh, um, disease of the, of the, in the mouth that, and you also have a heart condition, let's talk to your dentist and to your physician and see what we can do about that to lessen the incidence of issues with stroke and issues with heart attacks. Inflammation also causes uh, clotting, and the clotting is what causes the strokes. So it's important that you deal with that. Um, stress. We all have stress. All of us. Oh, good, good. You're one. <laughs> I'm going to retire, and the reason I'm going to retire is because I want to rebalance my life. And it's not that I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop working, but my life has gotten crazy, and it's time to rebalance. I just had identical twin grandchildren, uh, boys, and I want to spend some time. I lost my mother. I realized time, you, get, you don't get to choose those times. So I decided it's time for me to choose my times. So stress, anxiety, loneliness, loss of a spouse, uh, issues with uh, distress, all of those things cause the release of something called cortisol. And cortisol is the problem with stress in that it starts causing the damage. The way you can control stress is one with diet, eat healthy foods, also with exercise. It's really important that you exercise. Uh, you can decrease the amount of uh, cortisol in your body by exercise. And the other thing is when you go into your dentist and they do that terrible thing to you where they start probing your mouth and they say two, two, three, 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 <laughs> That's an indication of how deep the, what they call is the pocket. That's the top of the gum line to where there's an attachment between the gum tissue and the tooth. Two to three millimeters is pretty normal. Some people, four is normal. Above four is difficult to clean. And people that are under stress, those pockets get larger. So it's important. I, people that were under stress, I know when they come in because I used to be able to see them. They, were, they had greater inflammation, more bleeding, and the pockets had changed because the inflammatory uh, effect causes swelling of the tissue. So we had an increased pocket. So if you're getting that and you do well and suddenly you notice that, take a look at that and see that maybe it's something to do with stress. You can figure out how to alleviate some of that so that you can a better life for yourself. Now, this is the, the thing that we talk about all the time, tobacco. Tobacco is... And I'm not just talking about tobacco you smoke. I'm talking about tobacco you chew. We have severe cases of people when they chew tobacco, oral cancer. And the oral cancer, the, how you correct it once 
the patient has been di uh, diagnosed with oral cancer is so disfiguring that a person then becomes a recluse. They stay out of the public's eye, and then it causes greater stress and problems. That constant connection between tobacco and the gum tissue, or in, chew in chewing tobacco, there are so many other chemicals that are in that chewing tobacco, and you put that right against the tissue, and you have it there almost all the time. Or a lot of people, the juices from some of that go down the throat, and they get throat cancer. So we really, really recommend that people try to d break the habit. And there are so many ways to do it with tobacco now, uh, with drugs, uh, Shantrex. But Shantrex is very, you've got to be very careful. We have some cases where people have become so suicidal because they've taken Shantrex, so you've got to be careful with Shantrex. But there's also Nicorette. There's also other ways to control it. We also find that if you have a counselor or somebody you call into and talk to about your smoking or tobacco sensation, it works. It's more effective. Smoking tobacco is a product uh, problem. We find that electronic cigarettes, while I don't like electronic cigarettes at all, tend to give a lower dosage to the patient. And it tends to be a better thing than the actual cigarette. It's not good, but it's better. So when I look at tobacco, those are the concerns I have. So I don't, I don't know what the initiative on marijuana is going to do, but it probably will cause increased smoke. Now, marijuana is not as bad as tobacco, but just the, the use of, of tobacco, I mean, excuse me, smoke on the body, it causes a decreased healing in the mouth and those sorts of things. So it's really important that we try to negate that. That's why we don't like uh, some of the uh, air out there, some of the uh, pollution in the air. It does the same thing to us. So it's really important that we try to control those things in our body. And so tobacco is something that we'd like to control. And secondhand smoke is terrible. I grew up with a mother that smoked. And uh, it's not good for anybody to have secondhand smoke. And uh, a couple of my sisters uh, have asthma because of that, I think. So it's very important that we try in some way to control that. OK, now we're going to get some of the interesting ideas that we had out there. I thought, you know, we can talk forever. And I'll take your question. Some people want to know what the good to uh, what toothpaste are, whether it's a good toothbrush, uh, those sorts of things, and we can answer those. But I thought we'd talk about tattoos and piercing, because it's something that has an oral uh, physical health connection, but it's becoming more and more popular. And we've got to figure out how we deal with it, because there are different ways to deal with each one of those. Let's talk first about uh, tattoos. And I think the question that they have is 24% of the people between 18 and 36, I think it is, uh, 50. 50 have tattoos, but 36% of those are between the ages of 18 and 19. Now, the problem in Oregon is in order to get a tattoo, you have to be 18 years of age or you have to have parental consent. So what we're seeing is a lot of kids are doing tattoos in garages and things like that to each other. Well, there's kind of a lot of problem with that. <laughs> I mean, the problems are significant just with a regular tattoo. But let's talk about the regular, and then we'll talk about the other. Uh, some of the medical problems are there are allergies to the dyes. Those dyes have heavy metals in them, some of them in order to get the color. So the dyes are difficulty. Now, some of the new dyes are good because they can be uh, put closer to the surface. And there's a, a dye out there that was developed by a, a, a scientist at Harvard that you hit it with a laser light and it disperses and then the body removes it. Not a, not a lot of tattoo artists want their tattoos dispersed like that. So, so the issue is, uh, how do we deal with that? So those allergies to, to metals are real. The second thing is, if you get an MRI, those tattoos have metal in them, some of them. And, and magnetic resonancy uh, causes those to heat up. So you go in there, they'll ask you, do you have uh, removable partials in your mouth? They'll ask you, do you have tattoos? Uh, they'll ask you, are you taking a dermal medication? Uh, and all of those have metal. And so it's really important you know how to, you know those things and explain them ahead of time so that you don't have difficulty with that with MRIs. Hepatitis B and C. Um, I think the most important thing is if you, 
I'll talk to you about it later. I'll talk about it now. If you're going to get a tattoo, make sure that your tattoo artist has a hepatitis vaccine. Very important. I mean, your dentist has to now in order to practice. And a lot of the stuff that the dentist does in the mouth is not as invasive in many respects as what a tattoo is. So it's important they have the hepatitis vaccine because hepatitis B and C are lifelong problems. Hepatitis C can be a, a, a killer because hepatitis C can lead to cirrhosis of the liver and eventually cancer of the liver. Now there's a new drug out there that costs $1,000 a tablet, but that new drug can heal people, 90% of the people with hepatitis C. It has to be taken with a second drug and the overall course, the, if you're taking just the Savarti, which is the new drug, if you're taking that, it's about $89,000 for a complete uh, series of uh, medications. But mixing it with the other, it's up to $120,000. So the question in Oregon right now is, how do we spend our money? Because in the Medicaid world, there's an awful lot of people with hepatitis C. And the issue is, can we afford to give everybody, because they figured if they did everybody that hepatitis C in that world, there'd be only about $40 million to do everything else in Medicaid. So the state has decided that they're only going to take people in stage four with hepatitis C. Those are the people at most risk and have the best uh, outcomes. But people in one, two, and three, they've recommended not giving that drug yet. There's going to have to be something come up because giving that drug in the initial stages is going to cost less than not giving the drug and having to treat the other, the other problems with hepatitis C down the road. So they're going to have to figure that one out. Is there a hepatitis vaccination? Yes, there is. Yes. And it's usually two shots, and then you get a, you get a, uh, a, a subsequent one in about five years. And I've had it. Every dentist has to have it. Everybody that works in a dental office, except for the front office person, has to have it. From assistants to hygienists to everybody, anybody that works around a patient has to have a hepatitis vaccination. How long is it good for? Well, it, you have the two, and then you have a booster at about five years, and it's supposed to be a life, lifetime. There's also a herpes, this is again off the subject, a herpes zoster. Uh, um, vaccine now that's out that is really good. People that have had chicken pox oftentimes get a, um, it's called, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the name besides herpes zoster. Shingles. Shingles, thank you very much. See, there are people here that know more than I do. You know, a lot of more people than I do. But uh, the shingles, the problem with that is uh, it usually follows nerve pathways. It is very painful. It usually happens in older people that have had chicken pox. Now, most of us have had chicken pox. There's a herpes zoster vaccine out there that will uh, lessen the op your chance of getting it. And if you do get it, usually make it less uh, uh, of a problem, less painful and less uh, long lasting. So I recommend the herpes zoster vaccine too. Um, human papillomavirus. If uh, tattoos, uh, they've had transmission of the human papillomavirus. The human papillomavirus now is probably the cause of an awful lot of the oral cancer problems in, in young adults. There is a vaccine for young girls, and it should be a vaccine for all young people. And that vaccine will uh, take care of the transmission of human papillomavirus. And it should be, uh, it should be I think it's a three-set uh, series, but it's well worth it because what we're finding is human papillomavirus is one of the STDs, the sexually transmitted diseases that are out there now, and it can cause severe problems that we're finding just now uh, are happening because of that virus. And then HIV and TB, that's, uh, you know, it's strange when you get into a world of diseases and you go into HIV. HIV, when I started practicing, was such a big deal, and now it's, some, it's a controllable disease with medications and cocktails and everything like that. They believe they have a, um, a treatment that's in testing now that could prevent HIV. So it's an issue that is really important. But when you're getting tattoos, if the people are using dirty needles or the same ink, 
you have a real problem with uh, HIV, with TB, with hepatitis, and all of those. So if you're getting tattoos, first thing you ask is, do you have a hepatitis vaccine? Second thing you ask is, do you use new needles with every patient? And the last thing is, do you use new inks with every people? Because those are really important questions. You do not want them ever reusing any of that from patient to patient. Let's talk about care of tattoos, because I think that's important. First of all, you should treat it like a minor burn, and should, you should hopefully should cover it from four to 24 hours. It is uh, like a minor burn on, on your body. We'd ask you if you wash it, wash it with antibacterial soap, not peroxide or alcohol-based soaps, because you don't want it drying. You don't want it doing that. We'd ask you also, if you're going to moisturize it, that'd be good. If you're going to go out in the sun, cover it. Uh, the, you notice some people that have had tattoo for years, their tattoos turn blue or black. The sun tends to take the colors out of there. And so if a lot of people have what they call now sleeves, where they have tattoos from here on up, and a lot of that's exposed, and I think they'll see that under the shirt, it'll stay more colorful and after the shirt. So we recommend that people that have tattoos use SPF 50 or 30 or something like that just to protect them, their tattoos. Um, we're also looking at uh, don't use a washcloth. It's abrasive. Don't use it. If you're going to wash it, do it with your antibacterial soap in your hand. Uh, stay out of hot tubs and pools. Other people have been there. Don't do that. And uh, let's see, stay out of tanning beds. About 45 million people have tattoos in the U.S. 70% 17 regret, regret having them. 11% have to try to take them off. Now, there are three ways to take off tattoos. You can surgically remove them, abrasiveness, uh, like almost like a sandpaper over a period of time, or lasers. The cost of doing that, it depends on the, the inks they use and the intricacy of the design. But the, it takes several appointments, and it will take anywhere up to $150 appointment to get that off. And sometimes it goes into the thousands. So it's very important that you're certain. Now, a lot of that is tattoo regret because men or women put the, their boyfriend's name here, you know, and suddenly they're, they're not there anymore. They're with someone else. And I did, that's not so cool to have that name there. So I saw a young lady the other day have her boyfriend along her neck, and it was about this long a tattoo, Jackson. And I thought, I hope that stays for a long time because otherwise it's going to be a hard one to get off. Uh, I think the other thing that we want you to do uh, is to just make sure that with a tattoo that you're very careful with touching it. Um, as it heals, make sure you wash your hands. Make sure that you're not transferring any of the bacteria from your hands on there. And you know, it's very hard to do because you wash your hands and then you leave the bathroom and you grab the doorknob or you pick up the telephone, or you do those things. So it's really important that you wash your hands with antibacterial soap. And they're finding that antibacterial soap for everybody all the time is not a good idea. But if you have tattoos, it's a good idea. You're just talking about when it's new. Yes, yes I am. After, after that area is healed and, and that, then the issues of pools and hot tubs and the issues with uh, washing it with a washcloth and all that goes away. This is as it is new, you're right. Let's talk about piercings a little. Am I going too long? Let's see. I, I better hurry this up because there's some questions I want to answer. Uh, the piercings, uh, you've got to be careful about because a lot of the metals in the, in the jewelry are not um, uh, metals that you really want in your mouth or in your skin. Uh, they'll use uh, metals that are not noble like gold and silver. And the people can have, just like in fillings, they can have allergies to those metals. So it's really important that you pick the jewelry that you want very carefully. I think the second thing is uh, we want to make sure that, again, the tetanus, the SB is sub subacute bacterial endocarditis. That's where people have damaged heart valves. So it's very important that if you have some of those issues and you're going to get a piercing, that you're covered with antibiotics prior to doing that so that you're very careful. Granulomas is a constant irritation that eventually something grows up around that. Uh, there's swelling. They can aspirate. Oftentimes, the barbells they put in people's tongue, part of it comes off and it's aspirated down the throat, and then you have to go and get it. So 
that's a problem. Emergency room removal. Some people go in emergency room having tattoos, and the emergency room has to get the tattoo out of the mouth, uh, excuse me, the piercing <laughs> out of the mouth. And that's a real problem to get it out if the mouth is clap, clamped shut or something like that. So a aspiration is really a problem. Increased periodontal disease. People that have the little rings in their lips or the barbells on their tongue, every time they rub the back of their tooth or the front of their tooth on the gum line, the gum line will recede. So it goes down. So it's a cause of the problem there. Uh, orthodontics. People that have uh, braces, <laughs> catching one of those little piercings on your brace and it happens all the time, so it's just really important to watch that. Damaged cheek, tongue, gum, uh, chipped teeth. We see it all the time. People get a barbell and then they start talking and they bite down on it by mistake or they're biting on a sandwich and they chip their front teeth. Um, antibiotics for mitral valpola. Uh, once you get them, again, we'll go through this. Avoid kissing hot tubs and pools initially. Well, that's still an open wound. Um, wash your hands before touching it because they recommend that you rotate those and that you check the uh, barbell top that screws on there on a daily basis so that it doesn't come off. Uh, again, rinse with alcohol-free uh, mouthwash. No alcoholic drinks initially. Uh, small bites of food. Enjoy, uh, avoid chewing gum, sticky candy, and tobacco. And avoid aspirin because the aspirin can cause uh, decreased healing and it, uh, the blood will not clot as easily. Now, let's get to, there's some statistic down there. Let's get to the questions you asked, and I need those answered. My daughter gets a visible bill up between cleanings at the base of her teeth. She has six-month checkups, brushes faithfully, uses a Sonicare Air Floss, which is a, a, um, like a water jet or something like that in there and stuff. It, it cleans there. And she uses mouthwash. Can the bill be diet-related? Yes, it can. It could also be related to issues such as um, hormonal changes, food that you eat. It can be uh, associated with several things. So it's really important that you make sure that, you ha that if you have those things, check with your doctor because there are ways that that can be taken care of. It could be simply that you have a piercing in your tongue and it increases the calculus in your mouth because it increases the saliva in your mouth. Uh, so check that. Uh, why, are t why are my teeth sensitive sometimes to hot and cold? If you grind your teeth, if you love orange juice, if you love grapefruit juice, if you love any citric acid or anything like that, uh, lemon, <laughs> lemon drops, uh, those sorts of things, they're acidic and they take the surface of that tooth away and what happens is it becomes porous and inside the tooth then anytime hot and cold hits that, what will happen is you'll get a reaction. Best way to take care of that is there's a rinse out there called ACT, A-C-T. It's a mouth rinse, and if you're getting that sensitivity, my recommendation is buy a little bottle of it, it's not expensive, and rinse with it. And the best thing to do is brush your teeth, floss, brush, rinse, and then rinse with the ACT, spit it out, but leave the taste in your mouth because it's topical and it, is a, it re mineralizes the surface of the tooth, making it less sensitive. Um, why should I look for, what should I look for in a new dentist? This is a great one. This, we talked a little bit about risk assessment. Also, I'm not a big fan of people that advertise for being cosmetic. Every dentist should be cosmetic. So the issue is, what do they do when you come in that office? Do they, stress, do they stress home care? Do they do risk assessments? Do they treat you individually? Do they talk to you about nutrition as well as just filling a, a filling? Are they more holistic, and I mean that in a way that they, t they ask you about your medications, they talk to you about your, your, other, your physical needs as well as your dental needs? And those are the type of dentists that you'd go to, in my estimation. Uh, uh, do, if you have your wisdom teeth, do you need to get it out? I have one son that I had the wisdom teeth taken out, one son that did not. You do not need your wisdom teeth out unless they are, one, there's no room for them, or two, they are pushing their, uh, the, what they call is they're pushing on the other tooth, sort of the, the, uh, their horizontal impaction, so the wisdom tooth is like this and the other teeth are like this. Now, the reason you get wisdom teeth out when you're young is because the bone is less mineralized, it's softer, so getting that tooth out of there when you're younger is easier. Also, if it's going down towards the nerve that goes down that way, if the, root, nerve, if the roots are not fully formed, it's less chance of damage to that nerve. And also the issue with um, healing. You heal faster when you're younger. 
So those are the reasons you would get him out. But one son didn't need to get him out. He, they came in straight, he had plenty of room. There's no reason to take him out. And they're now saying you don't need to get your wisdom teeth out unless they're symptomatic or there's some other issue where you would have to down the road. Wisdom teeth that have not been taken out and are below the bone can become cystic. So if you have a wisdom tooth that hasn't come in and it's below the bone, I recommend on a, on a, every so often you get a picture of that to see if there's a cyst because that little capsule that forms that wisdom tooth stays around that tooth and it, become, it can start um, dividing into other cells which will cause a cyst. So just get that checked. Uh, I, why do I have bad breath? Even though brushing and using mouthwash, is there any way to get rid of bad breath? Bad breath could be diet. Uh, bad breath could be that you're not brushing your tongue. If you think of your teeth as a smooth object, look at your tongue, which is absolutely full of valleys. And it can hide all that bacteria and all that food in there. Brush your tongue uh, when, you do, when you do that. Other issues with your tongue, GERD can cause you some problems. Uh, it's, it's not just one thing that can cause you bad breath. So it's really important that if you're brushing your teeth and you're flossing, you're doing the right things and you still have bad breath, it could be something else and it should be checked. And discuss it with your, your uh, dentist and see. Uh, some of the other questions, and I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but I wanna make sure we get them answered. Why do gum lines recede? The connective tissue gets less flexible and so the gums tend to pull down. That's why they call older people long in the tooth because their tooth tends to go a little longer. It looks that way. So uh, also people tend to get what they call dark spots between their teeth. It's because the gums don't fill those spots anymore. That's why, uh, that's why gums recede. How does it affect my health? Well, if it's natural aging, it doesn't. But if it's due to periodontal disease or something else, the uh, smoking and those sorts of things, it can affect your health. So there are many reasons for recession. Uh, does high blood pressure affect your oral health? Yes, it does. High blood pressure is a problem because it, ca it can cause other cardiovascular issues, which again is an inflammatory problem. So your blood pressure is very important. And if you have high blood pressure and it's exceedingly high, maybe at times you should not have, your, you should not have work done. It's important to, uh, if you go to a dentist and they don't take your blood pressure, ask them to. Every time you go in there, not just once in a while. That is so important to have your blood pressure taken in your dentist office. Second thing, oral cancer exam. Oral cancer exams are not looking in the mouth saying, nope. Oral cancer exams are an exam where they take a small two by two gauze and they ask you to stick your tongue out and they look at both sides of your tongue. They look at the back of your throat. They take their finger and go down in the floor of your mouth to feel if there's any hardness or swellings or anything like that. They then pull your lips out to check and see if there's any hard spots in your lips and also along your gum line to see if there's any issues along the gum line. An oral cancer exam should be done at every exam appointment. So that should be done. And last one, my boyfriend cracked his front tooth. They didn't like the way the doctor fixed it. There are dark lines above the crown. What's going on? Um, how long do crowns and veneers last? Varies according to people's diets and uh, their make, make chemistry and all that. But the recommendation is the reason the black line forms is usually because your teeth uh, transilluminate uh, light. And if you're putting a crown over that, you stop the light from going through there. So right at the margin of that tooth, is it's gonna be a dark spot. Now, the more, the, the more porcelain the crowns, the less opportunity for that because it's usually due to metals. Second thing is, uh, certain foods, blueberries, teas and stuff will cause that staining, coffee, uh, that staining, and it's important that if that happens, then they should concentrate with a, what they call an end-tough brush, which is a very small brush that is not, it's a manual brush and you just go up there and brush around the margin of those crowns uh, once a day, and that should help. Um, seven years uh, for crowns and veneers. I have veneer that I've had for 30 years, so uh, it can be uh, longer than that. And, uh, you know, if you see crowns that you are not aesthetically pleasing, she didn't want to talk to her boyfriend about it because he was uh, very concerned about that. The issue that you might do is if their doctor comes in, I mean, if they, you know the dentist they go to or you go to that same doctor, just mention that, you know, he's very sensitive about this, but maybe you could mention it to him. Uh, it's affecting him. He doesn't like to smile, those sorts of things. Uh, and then when they go into the doctor, it's not a 
personal attack, it's a professional advice. And it makes it a little easier that way. Now, I've gone on long, five over seven minutes longer than I should have. And I do have questions you have. Otherwise, I will shut up and move out. <laughs> yes? What are your comments on whitening? Whitening, uh, there's several types of whitening. First, whitening toothpaste are a joke. So I'll tell you that first of all. I, whitening toothpaste, all they do is remove surface stain. They don't get into the tooth itself, even though some of them have peroxide, but it's at such a low peroxide level that it does not really do a lot. There are several other types. You can get a over-the-counter uh, whitening. There's white strips, and there's uh, also little trays you can make and stuff like that. I find the white strips are better than the trays that you make because they tend to leak. They don't tend to adapt to your mouth, and it's really important. You're putting something called carbamyl peroxide, which is a relative of hydrogen peroxide, in your mouth and having it sit on your teeth. If those trays do not fit, it increases your salivary flow, and that, that carbamyl peroxide is being taken out of those trays very quickly, and they do very little for you, and it's not good for you anyway. So Dennis, and I, I hesitate to say this because it sounds like we're referring, but Dennis will make a specialized tray just for your mouth. And then all you need is a drop, not a whole goop, but a drop in each one of those teeth. Because when you put it on, it fits so tightly that it goes all around your teeth. Whitening works there. There's also lasers that they use that they say one appointment will take care of it. It's usually more expensive. It does whiten the teeth. Remember, whitening of the teeth is due to stains in your diet and stuff. So it won't stay white all the time, and you may have to do it again and again. My wife cannot whiten her teeth because the, the chemicals cause her teeth to be so sensitive that she cannot do it. So we've mixed that with uh, the ACT fluoride, and we've cut the time that she has in her mouth. And my patients, I ask them to do a three-week, uh, I know that sounds long, but a three-week interval. I ask them to put just a drop in each one, and I check them at week one with shade guides, week one, week two, and week three. And that way you know if, it's, if it is progressing, number one. Number two, you can check on them to see if they are becoming sensitive. And number three, if the tray is not fitting properly and irritating the tissue or something like that, you can take care of that. Long answer to a short question, sorry. Any other questions? Yes? I've got five questions. Oh, man. <laughs> Does everybody have time? <laughs> Do you want a bathroom break? <laughs> you okay? Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, I started like grinding my teeth about 10 years ago. Is there any hints you can give for Right now. Do you have a night guard? Night guard's good. Is it a hard or a soft night guard? Hard. Okay. I had a hard night guard and I was clinching so bad I was starting to cause, uh, they call it a refraction right along the gum line where I'm starting to lose tooth structure. So I went to a soft night guard. So if you're not getting that, hard night guards are great. Uh, there's upper and lower night guards, that's good. A uh, couple things. First of all, I would recommend there are some isometric exercises you can use. Uh, what I always told my patients that clinched is before they go to bed at night, I want them to do isometric exercises. And the first thing I want them to do is I want them to put their fist under their chin and I want them to op open against this force. And I want them to do that five times and I want them to do, and then I want them to stop and then I want them to do one where they're open and I want the fist, I want them to resist the fist as it closes. And I want, if they can do five times and five repetitions of each one of those, I find that that relieves some of the tension here. Second thing is, don't do a lot of work before you go to bed at night. And, and that's easy to say, but I mean, don't get on your computer, uh, don't do your telephone, uh, try to read a book or something like that before you go to bed. Televisions are also not good because that bright, bright blue light tends to, um, to fire you up a little. So those are some of the ways that you could possibly help with the grinding. Um, Sonicare type toothbrush versus standard toothbrush? Uh, Sonicare, the ultrasonic toothbrushes like Sonicare, and Sonicare is the best of the ultrasonic toothbrushes, tends to have a greater motion and they tend to get less abrasive. Uh, you should always use a soft toothbrush no matter what. Hard toothbrushes tend to be abrasive and you think they clean better but they're not as pliable so they don't get into the cracks and crevices of your teeth. You'll wear out a soft toothbrush faster but it will clean better. Sonicare is a very good toothbrush. I use a Sonicare. Uh, I also, people with arthritis and older people, they cannot grip those, those small brushes. They don't have the movement. A Sonicare toothbrush helps them with that. So I, I recommend them. And how important is sugar? How much of that effect does it really have? 
Sugar feeds the bacteria that causes the release of the acid that causes the demineralization and decay. Oh, you're welcome, thank you. And so sugar is very important uh, for diabetes, for other things. We have so much sugar in things that you don't see. Ketchup, those sorts of things. So it's really important that you control that sugar. Uh, and um, if, you're gonna, if you want something sweet, xylitol is what we recommend, but keep it away from pets because it's a, it's a poison to pets, xylitol gum, so keep that away from them. But xylitol does not feed the bacteria to cause the acid. It's made from a birch bark, and it's been proven to be very effective. And last one, do you have a favorite type of floss? I, for me, I like unwaxed floss. I, because I have a bridge, because of being stupid in front of a uh, racket, uh, playing racquetball, I have to use the super floss, which has a threader, and then I can get under my bridge, and then I use the rest to floss with. Unwaxed floss, as you floss with it, tends to flay out so that all of those fibers are cleaning, not one. But some people have such tight contacts that they cannot get in with an unwaxed floss. It shreds. So then I recommend a waxed floss to get in there. And that's better than, than no floss at all. OK? Any other questions? I appreciate your attention. I'm sorry I've gone on too long. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>